Hey, it's Frank Ophinia, Warriors Hype Man. And I'm Captain Liang. And you're watching Bay Area Sports Wrap. They have played many more games at home than they have on the road, so a somewhat perilous imbalance. Um, I thought we had... Uh, two or three offensive possessions uh, where we didn't get organized and we got stagnant and that hurt our flow. We were in a good rhythm until then and then the pace slowed down. Uh, so we needed to get better organized offensively. That was definitely the key stretch of the game. And then the first five minutes of the third, I didn't like our, our energy. I didn't feel like we responded well enough and Denver kind of controlled the game uh, from there. Hi, and welcome to Bay Area Sports Wrap. Alongside Marco Ukalovich, I'm Ryan Leong. On this episode, our guest is Cyrus Soxis, the host of Locked On Warriors, your best source to follow the Golden State Warriors. Be sure to check out Locked On Warriors on YouTube. You can also follow Cyrus on threads at Dog Wild. Cyrus, thanks for joining us on Bay Area Sports Wrap. Thanks for having me. I, I apologize again for the delay. Uh, Marco, nice to meet you, man. How are you guys doing? Good, man. Nice to finally meet you too, Cyrus. Yeah, yeah. Right back at you. Right All right, great. Well, Cyrus, uh, tough loss for the Dubs as they hosted the Nuggets on Sunday. Televised nationally on ESPN, the country saw how the Warriors looked like a team that had won 9 of 10 games, but they also looked like a team that belongs in 10th place in the West. And Cyrus, how would you assess the season to date for the Warriors? Disappointing, uh, slightly underachieving. Uh, they, they, I've been saying on Locked on Warriors, and I don't know if you guys agree with me or not, and, you know, oftentimes my takes are not the most popular, but what I always tell people is check back two months later, and I I never, two, three months after I say it, I rarely ever hear people say, oh, wow, you were dumb for saying that, you are wrong. No, it's just, you know, I, I'm lucky in in, uh, in knowing what the hell I'm talking about when it comes to this field, because it's that's the extent of it. Ask me about anything else, and I'm an idiot. Um, but my take is this, man. I think the roster still is good. Uh, I think the roster can compete with anyone. Um, but my biggest issue with last night's game is that they blew another huge lead. It, they, they led the game by 15 points, blew another one. And when you look at why they blew it, it's because her decided to abandon what's a huge, the two biggest reasons why the team has turned things around this year. Draymond Green who only played 27 minutes. I still don't, I haven't gotten a clear cut explanation for that. I know he had six turnovers, but that doesn't excuse playing him 10 less minutes than Nikola Jokic. The team has no one else who can defend Jokic. So why Draymond Green only played 30, 27 minutes when Jokic, who put up a historic night statistically, I mean, at 32 points, 16 to 6, 16 rebounds, that is an absurd night. And so you play Draymond Green 10 minutes less, why? Uh, you know, and then, the, and then the other thing that just really disappointed me was Kerr once again going with the players that he's comfortable with, his favorites, versus who's the best players on this team. What I mean by that is Jonathan Kaminga should be playing more than 24 minutes, and last night there was no good reason to not play more. He was one of the best players on the court statistically and otherwise. And But, but the one thing I think Kerr has been doing this season, recently, over the last month or so, that's been really successful, you know, everyone points to Draymond Green bringing everything together, but... Another thing he's been doing subtly, which I've certainly noticed, and I brought this up on Locked On Warriors, and then he abandoned this last night, is he's realized you can't play Wiggins and Clay Thompson on the court together. Um, th those two on the floor at the same time is a massive detriment, man. It's a combination of, of those two players no longer being consistent, bringing it on a night-by-night -night basis. Um, and those two players as a duo, their net rating is by far the worst on the Warriors. It's a minus 134. So, 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 in case that just to repeat, just to make this a little more clear, when those two players play together this season, and I know Wiggins has had a, a good turnaround in recent weeks, but it, it doesn't mask this stat. They're getting outscored when Clay Thompson and Andrew Wiggins are on the floor together by opposing teams by 134 points this year. That is outrageous. And Kerr has been cognizant of that. We haven't seen those two playing together. It's a huge reason, I think why he shifted to Clay coming off the bench so that those two can be staggered and not playing together. But last night, he he panicked. You know, it's a Nuggets team that, you know, is one of the biggest, most challenging competitors. And instead of going with what's been working recently, big, you know, Draymond Green relying on him, playing your youth. We got another DNP from Moses Moody, except for a minute 45 in garbage time, which doesn't count. Trace Jackson Davis saw his minutes re reduced. You know, we saw Kevon Looney defending uh, Nikola Jokic, and that hasn't worked ever. 
I mean, I mean, Kamal Looney was entirely out of the rotation in that 2022 first round playoff series for a very good reason. He can't guard Nikola Jokic. So, I, you know, I'm going to go back to what's been the primary culprit for most of the malaise for the Warriors this last year and a half, and that's been coaching, and it's very disappointing. Sorry to be long-winded there. How and, and why do you think this game kind of flipped so drastically like it did? I think we may have relaxed a little bit when we got up 15. Can't do that against defending champs. But uh, we'll learn from it. But for us to close that second quarter 14 to zero, tie it up at half, and then start the third on a 14 to four run, that's a 28 to four run in their building after being down 16. That's what I'm most proud about. We have <laughs> August Iris. Now, you know, I was going to say this really has been the most frustrating season watching the Warriors this year. Just, you know, when you think they, they got their stuff together, they put together a little win streak. Then they have games like they had last night against the Denver Nuggets where they get out to the big lead and then the second half comes and the fourth quarter comes and they just like forget how to play basketball. And, and I really attribute that to Kerr's coaching because you're right, he does not have the right players in there at the right times. I don't understand what has happened with him going even back to even last season too against, you know, against the Lakers in that second round series. I mean, he's been being outcoached Throughout this season, uh, you know how many games have they blown up? What eight, nine? They should they should be have the same sort of record as Denver does right now. When you look at all the games they've blown this season, they should be at the like a thirty-seven and eighteen-ish type of record. And you know, going forward here, what do you think Kerr is going to end up doing here? Do you think is he is he going to keep playing his favorites, or is he going to finally realize, look, I need to have Draymond out there, I need to have Kaminga out there? Um, you know, being the force that he is, because it's just, I get, I watched yesterday's game and I just wanted to throw my TV out the window in the yes. second half. I was so, well, actually before the, the end of the second quarter, when they blew the 16 point lead, I was like, what are they doing? Yeah, I'm totally with you. Um, You know, and Kerr just got the contract extended. I feel like a huge reason why Kerr got the extension was because he was finally appeasing management, the front office, who, I mean, this, this, this two timeline thing, when you look at a big picture, it is successful, and it's what they've had to do. I mean, Bob Myers put this plan in place. You know, Joe Lake is going to take a lot of credit as well, and maybe he should. But this two-timeline thing was out of necessity. I mean, they, they, the San Antonio Spurs are the only NBA team outside of maybe the 60s Celtics who, is, who have shown a model, a blueprint for sustaining a dynasty beyond just one generation, right? And, and, a, and a huge reason for that was Kawhi Leonard. They developed a future superstar alongside these three uh, you know, future Hall of Famers. And the Warriors had the exact same blueprint. And we're seeing it now with Kaminga. And, and it's it's very important to note that Kaminga, who knows if he's even playing right now, if Draymond Green wasn't having his early season, you know, issues. If Andrew Wiggins was completely, like, out of whack in terms of his playing skills for a good part of this season. Like, I, Kaminga was playing out of necessity. Um, actually, Marco, I think last year was even more frustrating because the, the Ty Jerome-Anthony Lamb minutes were like truly driving me insane. Like I, I like I kept looking at that bench with Kaminga and Moody and thinking to myself, this is what Bob Myers envisioned. Start playing those two last year, start right. developing them because who knows where those two would be right now if we'd seen them getting a run a year ago versus now. Um and, and so it is I'm totally with you in terms of the frustration. Um the I the good news is we've seen Kerr whether or not he wants to, whether or not he's doing it begrudgingly, but we've at least started seeing him uh, have some trust in his young players. We, you know, we like Brandon Pajemski is a perfect example. He's getting a ton of minutes. I don't, you know, I almost feel like it might be too many minutes. And I'm curious to see if that's where the minutes are going to come from for Chris Paul, who's coming back tomorrow against the Wizards, or if it's going to be Lester Quinones. I don't know where else you get those minutes from, but I'm with you. Steve Kerr, and I've been saying this on Locked On Warriors a lot, he has a, a, a crutch. Uh, you know, I don't know if, if infatuation is the right word. I'm kind of facetious using that term specifically. But, look, he's he has this, like, affinity for ball handlers. Like, he feels very comfortable when he has people on the court out there who have the ball handling skills of a traditional point guard. Um, and the thing is, like, he used to have players on this roster that would mask his crutch, meaning, like, Andre Iguodala had point guard skills. But the dude was, like, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, could defend anyone, you know, wasn't a great shooter, but he was fantastic in every other aspect of the game. He has Sean Livingston, who 
was, you know, a, a point guard, but he was six eight, right? So he gave you length, he gave you size. Um, and, and those players were replaced with Corey Joseph, with Ty Jerome. And so you saw this massive drop off until those two players were off the roster. And now you're seeing those minutes taken over by Brandon Pajemski. Like, I don't think it's a surprise that Lester Quinones is just getting a run. Um, he's getting significant minutes. And for a very young player who just got a guaranteed deal, and it's largely because he he gives Steve Kerr that that weird sense of security uh, from being a, a, you know, having traditional point guard ball handling skills. That is th- Steve Kerr's security blanket. That's what makes him feel good. Unfortunately, not every player of the game can can dribble like that, can handle the ball like that, can facilitate like that. But you also don't need that many point guards. Like, I feel like in Steve Kerr's perfect world, he has, he has like five point guards out there. And you're never going to win a title like that unless those five are all like six, eight and, you know, can do other things. So I, I, on one hand, I, I'm cautiously optimistic because we've seen Trace Jackson Davis get a run. You know, we're, we're seeing Kaminga, thankfully, you know, being a starter and getting consistent minutes, even though I feel like 24 is shortchanging him on a night where you really need him against that Nuggets team. But the Moody DNP, I hope that doesn't continue. And I, I yeah, it's, it's on one hand, I'm frustrated, Marco. On the other hand, I'm, I'm still have this cautious optimism because they do, I, I really feel confident in saying this. I do think they have the roster to compete with the best of them, but you just have to play the right guys. And, you know, that's just for some reason, been an issue with Steve Kerr for the last year and a half. This is Zena Kata, host and analyst on NBC Sports Bay Area, and you're watching Bay Area Sports Wrap. All right, we're joined by Cyrus Satsis here on Bay Area Sports Wrap. And Cyrus, uh, why do you think uh, Bob Myers decided to quit the Warriors organization, and how do you think Mike Dunleavy is doing as his replacement? Uh, you know, I've, I've said that. So Baxter Holmes had a report that came out from ESPN a, a few days ago now, maybe a week ago. Um, that, in my op- opinion, uh, beautifully encapsulated what's been going on with this team the last year and a half. And it's what I've been reporting on Locked On Warriors for a year and a half. Bob Myers and Steve Kerr, uh, starting at the beginning of last year, after they won the championship, were engaged in a proxy war. Meaning behind the scenes, for the first time in their run together, they had different visions for how to move forward. Uh, Steve Kerr, because of, the, uh, because of winning the championship, suddenly felt, okay... I have veterans here who just won a title, and I can just ro- keep going with that, even though these veterans are aging, even though you look at the reason for the Warriors winning the 2022 championship, and a lot of it came down to the depth that he had, the size that he had from, from players like Bielitsa, Otto Porter Jr. Um, you know, and and uh, he, he didn't, and keep in mind, the 2022 Golden State Warriors, if you look at that roster, did not have a single traditional point guard on that roster. That, to me, is is symbolic of Bob Meyer's brilliance. Like, he knew what the right pieces were to put on a Steve Kerr team because I think he was aware that if you give Steve Kerr smaller-type point guards, he's going to play them. And in today's NBA, you need size. You need athleticism. You need more than just someone who can facilitate an offense and dribble the ball efficient, efficiently. Um, but, uh, you know, he snuck in Ty Jerome with that two-way deal, and he started giving Ty Jerome a lot of minutes. Ty Jerome averaged nearly 20 minutes a game last year. I mean, that... I don't know how you justify that. Um, and the same with Anthony Lamb. Anthony Lamb was getting extended minutes. So, th- so it started this proxy war where Bob Myers had his draft pick and James Wiseman never playing. He had J- uh, Jonathan Kaminga and Moses Moody lined up to be the next phase of this team. And But Steve Kerr was banishing him to the bench and, you know, giving two-way players minutes instead. And so – and. A combination of that, Joe Lacob, I love him as an owner. I think if you're a Warriors fan, you you have to love this man to the end for what he's brought to the table. If you're an old school Warriors fan like me, I mean, I, Mark, I don't know if you're from the Bay Area. I know, Ryan, you are. But, dude, you remember these old owners, man. Chris Cohen, uh, uh, Frank Muley beforehand. I mean, dude, that was a disaster. So I think if, you, if you're old enough to remember those owners, you're eternally grateful for Joe Lacob. Even that, that, that LeBron James trade uh, uh, proposal, even though the idea itself was kind of wacky, at least you have an owner who's like willing to make these big, bold moves to stay relevant. I personally love it. But, um, you know, but at the same time, he's not the easiest owner to work for if you're a GM. He's probably blowing up your phone all the time. He probably has a million opinions of his own. So in, in, from what I've heard and from my own research uh, and my observation skills, the reason why Bob Myers left, it was twofold. One is... He came to a realization that his head coach had a different idea for how to move forward than him, and he publicly admitted that. That's when I think everyone should have been aware there was a lot of dissension behind the scenes. When Bob Myers is publicly saying, what's the, and he, literally, like in front of everyone, for, for the whole world to see and hear, when he came out and said that I have a coach who's not going to, like, I think 
don't call me verbatim, I'm paraphrasing, but he came out and said, what's the point in signing a big if you have a coach who's never going to play him, right? Because he was addressing the fact that a lot of fans and a lot of uh, media members were curious why the Warriors were keeping this small team, right, instead of getting bigger. And that was his answer. It's like, what's the point? We have a coach who doesn't like bigs, who doesn't, who won't play him. You saw James Wiseman get traded as a result. I hope that someday he doesn't bite the Warriors in the ass, although that's a much safer bet than, than Kaminga or Moody if you ever decided to move on from them. But, um, yeah, so it was just those two things. It was Bob Myers realizing, okay, I have a coach who no longer subscribes to my vision, and I don't feel like fighting this. And then I have an owner who uh, is a little much. You know, he has a beautiful family. He's got, you know, a beautiful wife and three beautiful children. Um, you know, I'm guessing the stress levels from working for ESPN are a fraction of what it was with the Warriors. And, dude, you look at, like, I mean, he left at, I think, a beautiful time, man. He looks damn good in hindsight. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's like, just talking about the Warriors while the Warriors themselves are, are two games above 500. Um, you know, mired in one of the most dramatically filled seasons I've ever experienced. I mean, you two cover the team. I mean, this I, I, I don't know if you felt the stress I felt covering this squad. It's like every day it's a different narrative. It's different drama. It's like, you know, you have a team that's, like, kind of sensitive about reporting negative information. So you always have to be, like, balancing this fine line of like not offending the warriors while also being honest and transparent to your audience it's just it's it, this has been a headache man so i i totally understand why bob myers left he he realized life is easier and i've done i've won four titles my reputation sound um i miss the guy though because i i do believe he he should be much more largely credited and responsible for the dynasty than anyone else in my humble opinion Chris Paul had said something yeah, different, and maybe he, oh, he's going to get tossed, there it is, Scott Foster says goodbye, and now Steph Curry grabs Chris Paul to hold him back from going back at Scott Foster. I, I, I do agree about that, and you know, just to answer your question, going back, I followed the Warriors since I was five years old in 1980, and to this yeah. I still believe the worst trade in NBA history was when the Warriors sent Robert Parrish and that first round pick to the Celtics for Joe Barry Carroll, who had like one 50 point game for the Warriors in his entire career with them. And, and yeah, the Celtics go in and win three titles in the eighties and the Warriors being the laughing stock, only second worst to the Clippers. So yep. that's all for I go back with this team. And, but speaking, I'm like how you, you did the Bob Myers transition here and with, with Dunleavy Jr., you know, one of his oh, yeah. big yeah, transitions, right. you know, in this past offseason was getting Chris Paul, who I just don't think, you know, he meshes with, with this team because Chris Paul is more of a one on one isolation type of guy. He's not a ball movement type of guy. And, and, and I think we've we've noticed that and witnessed that this season when he's has the ball he likes to shoot threes when he's which he's not good at he likes to drive and, and not pass the ball and not move it around so you know you mentioned him coming back and maybe stealing minutes away from maybe Pajemski um maybe you know from like guys like Moody who deserve it and, and, and GP too so do you think that you know the lack of what they did is this training deadline just getting rid of Corey Joseph and not getting a big or getting someone that could really help them and and not getting rid of Chris Paul <laughs> has hurt this team going forward for their playoff run? Or so uh, I can't argue against you in that, right? I mean, I really wish the team was more active than just uh, moving Corey Joseph's contract. I will say it was it was a subtly big move because I, I don't know about you, but the, the Corey Joseph minutes this season were like driving at least me insane. I it just made no sense. Like I, he was not doing anything beneficial out there. Uh, you know, I, I heard the best analysis of him came from fans, and that he looked like the guy at your your local uh, rec center, uh, your local club sport. You know, it just just <laughs> nailing just you know the, the old guy who could still somehow score and, and cause havoc out there because yeah. he knows how to use his body better than, better than anyone else. Um, it's I I thought that was the best analogy. Cause, but look, I'm with you. I agree. Um, the, the Chris Paul thing, I don't like. I don't personally mind Chris Paul playing. Where I have an issue with it is him getting thirty minutes. Like that's what Steve Kerr was giving him on, on a lot of nights. Like, like, like it's too much. Like you could play Chris Paul 15, 20 minutes, and that's plenty, man. Like I, you know, and and so, but Steve Kerr has this crutch. He has this like weird. Uh, you know, fetish is not the right word. I don't, I don't know what the right word is, but he just has this dependency on point guards. It makes him feel comfortable and safe out there. And so I like the fact that Corey Joseph was taken out of the mix, but you're right, dude, because Chris Paul, my fear is he's going to come back and all of a sudden we're going to see him closing games, which I don't think he should be doing. Because if he's closing games, now you have 
a backcourt that has an average height of six one, six one and a half out there. And that's not going to do it defensively. That's not going to work. But that's Steve Kerr. That's there's going to be a good chance we're going to see a lot of that this year. And that's as we go down the stretch. And that's not going to be beneficial, I think. So I'm totally with you. The I forgot to answer your Mike Dunleavy question. And I'll keep it short. I look the perception of the Warriors is that Mike Dunleavy Jr. is the GM. The reality of the situation is he has that title, but Steve Kerr is calling all the shots. Meaning, like Dunleavy Jr. is. He is the GM. I don't doubt he has some uh, authority and has some space uh, in terms of decision making, but nothing is signed off without Kerr being okay with it. Like I, you don't construct a roster like this um, with, uh, unless your head coach is specifically demanding it, asking for it. There's no other roster that's this is the smallest team in the NBA for a very good reason. It's because the GM is trying to create a roster that the coach wants. Um, so you know, that, so people need to be aware of that. With that said. Mike Dunleavy Jr., I thought, nailed it in the draft. I love Pajemski. I love Trace Jackson Davis. And I think that was huge. Um, like, I was clamoring for Cam Whitmore because I saw him falling in the in the draft. And I was like, how this guy is available? How do you not take him? And he might still end up being a, a star in this game. But the Brandon Pajemski piece, he's a great fit. I love him. I love him. I don't, you know, I think he was a, you look at the Warriors five years from now, and you look at like Pajemski, Moody, Kaminga, Trace Jackson Davis. E. Santos, Lester Quinones, like the future is bright and I'm really stoked. And I want to give Mike Dunleavy Jr. credit for that. I mean, he was, he was largely responsible for that draft. Um, the Chris Paul thing, I will say this, that what I love about him, I, even though I'm, I'm deathly afraid that Kerr's going to go back to giving him 30 minutes a night and having him in the closing lineup, he has also been largely responsible for the development of Jonathan Kaminga. Um, you saw at the beginning of the season, like, like his, the coaching staff had not, been invested in Kaminga like they, they just they just don't seem to um care that much about about his growth and 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 you know developing him into like a future you know all-star superstar type player uh so Chris Paul has taken Kaminga under his wing and has developed him himself he's coaching him and I want to give Chris Paul credit for that that's huge um you know and Draymond Green has also taken on that role so it's, it's almost like the, those two veteran players have been making up for whatever deficiencies come from the coaching staff in, in regards to their approach with developing young players. So I want to give Chris Paul credit for that because I don't know if Kaminga's where he's at without Chris Paul this season. And I want to give Mike Dillon Jr. credit for the draft. I thought that was awesome. But I'm also totally with you that I'm deathly afraid of what's to come, man. Like, I do not know what we're going to get with Chris Paul. Um, again, if, you get, if you're giving him 15, 20 minutes a game, if you're letting him run the second unit, if he's not finishing games, I think you can live with him and you could be successful with him. But again, when you start giving him 30 minutes, when he's, he's closing games, he's 39 years old or he's about to be. I, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you in that regard. <laughs> All right, Cyrus, one last question for you. We're running out of time here, but want to know if you think the Warriors can make it to the sixth seed and avoid the play-in tournament. Yes, if Kerr plays young players. No, if Kerr still thinks that his old veterans can somehow save the day. Uh, and I have, I can't, I don't know how anyone can predict which way Kerr is going to go. I thought we were trending in the right direction until that Nuggets game. And then all we saw was his reliance on, you know, that, that the four, the four, right? Draymond, and like, except Draymond wasn't even playing. He only played 27 minutes. I, like, I don't know, if Paj like, let me ask you guys this. Do, are you cool with Pajemski? Like, he led the team in minutes at the half. Um, he, I think, he, I think he finished third or fourth in minutes, but but he was alongside Wiggins, Clay, and, and Curry, and getting thirty plus minutes last night. Those are the four players. Are you guys cool with Pajemski having that big of a role? Because I love the kid, but I just don't know if like he should be playing that much. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I'll just go real quick and say that he, I like that he starts the games, but he shouldn't be finishing the games. His his minutes should be 20, 25 max. That's it. He's not experienced enough to be closing games with this team. And I think that's when you need to have play in there or in someone in that fashion. But I like his what he's what he's been given the Warriors and the energy and the rebounding that you know they they have been lacking. But but yeah, I agree. He should not be closing games and the, the, the 30 minutes is way too much for him. Yeah. What do you think, Ryan? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm also curious to see what your thoughts are as well on Clay Thompson coming off the bench. I think he's been a great product. That's been one really smart move so far as getting the production he's gotten, even though he had a, you know, he had a scoreless second half after scoring 23 points in the first half. Yeah, I, I love, I, I like the move a lot going to the bench. I play this clip on Locked On Warriors a lot from Greg Popovich. Uh, just this this uh, this last media day during the offseason before the season formally began, he uh, answered a question about, uh, you know, 
the, the approach to bringing players off the bench. And his answer was, if Manu Ginobili can come off the bench, anybody can come off the bench. And I've been playing that soundbite to no end just because it makes too much damn sense to not play repeatedly. Um, and I, I like the move. Um, and I'm with you, dude. Like, like, I do wish Steve Kerr was more aware when Clay starts seeing his shots not falling because he had that. Because you're right, he had 23 points all in the first half, still ended up leading the team, which is crazy. But he, he had no points in the second half. He was oh, he only had three field goal attempts. They were all three point shots. He missed them all. And you know, at a certain point, like that, I feel like that's where Steve Kerr has to be aware with Clay. Like some nights he shows it. Some nights you're like you're, you're encouraged because he does bench Clay at the end of a game if he's not shooting well, and you're going, "Wow, Clay, like, Steve Kerr's getting it." And then you have a game like last night where you know he's out he's out there again getting the extended run. Um, you know, and I'm not you look. I, I was personally hoping the Warriors would trade Andrew Wiggins. It's nothing personal. There's a weird sect of the base that suddenly like like loves this guy like he's been a lifelong Warrior. I have nothing against him personally, but and, and I don't mind him being on the team if you're staggering his and Clay's minutes. But when those two are on the court together, that minus 134, like the next worst duo on the Warriors is Wiggins and Kevon Looney, and they're like I think a minus 91. That's how big of a difference there is between the worst duo and the second worst. Minus 134, dude, that is awful. Like, there's no way to positively spin that. And I just wish Kerr would be consistent in understanding that if this team is going to make some noise and be successful, you got to start playing Trace Jackson Davis more. You got to remember that Moses Moody actually knows how to play basketball. He's a good player. Like, the, the stat sheet won't always show it, but it also doesn't always show it for Pajemski either. But Steve Kerr seems to have all this faith in the in the rookie and Pajemski, but his third-year player, Moses Moody, for some reason, he, has, he doesn't trust him. And I just, you know, on a consistent basis, like some nights you'll see him, some nights you won't. I just wish there was consistency there in terms of the young players and understanding that these guys can play – and if you just give them, if you just show some faith and confidence in these kids, they will reward you for that. But he, you can see the conflict. He's, he's, you know, he he constantly, uh, you know, looks to Wiggins and Clay and and you know, Steph. There's no argument. I mean, you got to ride or die with him. But with with those two, like he just constantly, I think, is remembering the championship, and he thinks that those two players are still that. And even Wiggins, I mean, you got to remember, he's the second highest paid player on this team. And so even though he's tur he's improved his game a lot from, from early season, for your second highest paid player, you need more than like 14 points. Is that what, I think that's what he got last night. And, and that's what he's putting up mostly. It's like these these mid these mid-range like 14, 15 point nights. And that's not enough. Like they, like they need more. And I just wish Moses Moody would get more of a run. I think Trace Jackson Davis is your answer for your size issue. Like he I, I don't see any negative playing him out there he's you know he'll make rookie mistakes but he doesn't make them that often and everyone's making mistakes so that's what I hope for man I, I think if this Warriors team has hope if you're if the coach just belies some confidence and faith in these youngsters so we'll see how it goes man it's been a, it's been a tiring year though I don't know about you guys but I'm exhausted <laughs> covering this team this year all right Cyrus well you know hey next time when you come on you know be sure to be a little more you know tell, tell us more tell us how you really feel you know yeah. Just yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I won't hold back so much, time, I promise. I, yeah, I won't hold back. <laughs> no problem. Hey, thanks again, Cyrus, for joining us on Bay Area Sports Wrap. Again, be sure to follow Cyrus on threads at Dog Wild and check out Locked On Warriors on YouTube. And that does it for this episode of Bay Area Sports Wrap from Marco Kolovich. I'm Ryan Leong, and we'll see you next time. Hi, Drew Amanda here for Bay Area Sports Wrap. Please give us a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.